Hello, my name is Guilherme Hermeto, and this talk is Observing Node.js, Using Metrics to Improve Your Application Performance. There are many ways to improve application performance. The one way we'll focus here today in this talk is how to use metrics to understand how your code impacts your application health, and how can you create a feedback loop to evolve your coding style and create better applications. Before we start, let me introduce myself. I'm a senior platform engineer with the Node.js platform team at Netflix. We run an internal serverless Node.js platform that powers the devices, user interfaces, and AUIs for our content production efforts. For any platform changes, we run canaries and watch the metrics to make sure the platform remains healthy. And because of that, I have a lot of experience using what I call metrics-driven development to constantly evolve my code and not have a negative impact on the platform metrics. It creates this feedback loop. You write code, you run a load or a canary, you gather the metrics, then you analyze and evaluate if you need to start over. And this should work for any language. The metrics you watch will be different, but the process is the same. Well, it's easy for me to say, use metrics. But which ones? There are so many of them. And to be honest, it's not immediately obvious how to use them. And often you need to use a combination of two or more metrics to understand what you do with your application health. Let me start introducing you to your new best friend, Process CPU Utilization. It is the first indicator of application health because it's a sensitive metric. High CPU utilization can be caused by many pathologies. Synchronous code blocking the event loop, process restarts. That's interesting. When the process restarts, it usually spikes the CPU. So looking at a chart of your fleet and seeing high CPU, it actually might mean that some of the instances might be restarting. It could also be pressure on the garbage collector. If scavenger is working a lot for some reason, maybe a high promotion rate, CPU usage will increase. The event loop lag can indicate there is an unhealthy amount of synchronous code being executed. It's not the easiest chart to analyze. So that's why we use it in conjunction with the CPU utilization metric. It makes it easier to digest. If these charts start moving up on the y-axis, it's probably bad news. It means that you take longer and longer for the next event loop tick, which also means that the request rate will drop. Heap utilization, the good old heap. If it's growing on the y-axis, it means you probably have a memory leak. It usually takes a while to manifest, so it's not that easy to catch unless you're monitoring and alerting on metrics. And do you understand the issue that caused the chart you see right now on your screen in a few minutes? Request rate. This is all about how many requests your app can receive in a period of time. Well, it's no surprise that we like to bug at it in one second intervals, which give us requests per second or RPS. You can also add useful labels or tags like status codes or path. It will allow us to filter or create aggregations by that given label. So as an example, we can see how many requests are returning 200, how many requests are returning 500, and how many requests are returning any other status code. This is a must have for any applications running production. It's important to notice that this metric also affects CPU utilization. An increase on this metric 
it will effectively mean it's an increase in CPU utilization. And it, it is expected. Uh, more requests means that you're going to need more CPU. And because it's directly related, it means that to get more requests, you're going to need more CPU, which means that eventually you're going to need more instances. Request latency. Well, this is a good one. So many people think immediately on this metric when we talk about application performance. That's what they understand by application performance. What this metric is going to tell you is how long your requests are taking, which eventually can translate how long your customers are waiting. It is important that this metric is bucketed into percentiles because you want to know how long your average request is taking and how long your longer requests are taking, right? The ones on the 99 percentile, the 99.9 .9 percentile, you want to know the outlier. In-flight requests, that's an interesting one. So this metric measures how many concurrent requests your app is handling, not how many requests your app is receiving. Requests being handled are requests that have been received, decued from the task queue, and are being processed by your application server. It's also a very useful metric to indicate when you have a handler or middleware leak, because if you do, it means your application might not be sending the responses to the user, which means the request will eventually time out. Process restarts. Oh, well, there is no controversy there. If your application is crashing, you need to know about it, period. And it's pretty easy to look at it and figure out you have a bug in your code. But not always which bug. So to debug the issues, you have to resort to diagnostic tools like logging, tracing, and even analyzing core dumps. You're probably thinking, wow, that's awesome. I learned so much. But now what? Now I'll we'll show you a few examples based on real cases I saw in production and show you how can they affect your metrics. To showcase that, I created a simple application using only open source software, which you can find on GitHub. That's the repo you see right there on your screen. It has a script that will set up Prometheus, Grafana, and Postgres using Docker Desktop. Okay, so let's do this. The first example will show you how to identify performance problems. They are not caused by a bug per se, but by a coding style that's not suitable for Node.js. Even though it might be fine for other languages, it's not for Node. And it does not crash the app, it's just very inefficient. This is our route handler file. And in this file, we have a percentile class that has a static builder and returns this builder class here. This builder class, it's a classic builder that you would see in a language like Java that has chainable methods and a build method and eventually we return a um, pre-configured percentile. And then here below, we have this route handler that you know, uses the builder to build this percentile and eventually uses the percentile and then finally returns OK. Now, if we look at the charts for the metrics, Okay, when I start to load test this, I started with um, a baseline being loaded with about 4K requests. Uh, this baseline route is an echo that just returns the request headers back. And um, you can see that's pretty stable. Here in this location, I I start the call to that particular endpoint. And you see that 
I added a little bit more than 10%. Uh, when I did the load, I added 10%. And you can see a little bit more here. But you're going to see a 25% increase in CPU. We don't know if that is reasonable or not, because if you have a route that doesn't do anything, and then you start loading a route that has business logic, you're bound to have more CPU, right? So you, you really don't know if that is correct or not, if that's reasonable or not at, at that particular point. You can see here that latency is stable. Um, all true. So that's not a problem. You see that you have more event loop lag, but it is expected that, you know, if you increase uh, the CPU usage of synchronous code, you are expected to have increase on event loop lag. Right? Here we also see that you can trace the heap pretty much horizontally. Uh, it doesn't deviate too much. Uh, same with the in-flight requests. You have a little bump here, but that's normal. That's nothing. If you look at the scavenger, the minor GC, uh, you see that it kind of follows the request rate. So this is expected, okay? Um, going here, what I did was like, okay, so 10%, good. Uh, let me see what happens if I, you know, shift all the traffic from all the load that was happening on the baseline into that endpoint. That's what I did here, right? There was a 60% um, increase on the CPU at this point right? from the original baseline one. And um, you see here, nothing really changes anywhere. Okay, so let's go back. So here I made a small change. It's the exact same code that the other brought handle the other file. But in this case, I'm defining the builder as a top level in this module. And um, you see here that I just returned the builder, the builder references, the percentile, the percentile references the builder, and that's okay. We have this getter here, and you see that is the exact same route handler. At this point here, I shifted the traffic to this new endpoint. So at this point, 100% of the traffic starts going to the new endpoint where the class is defined on, on the top level. And um, you see here that if you average this, it's going to be like a 5% increase, 4 or 5% increase uh, over the original one instead of a 60% increase. It is a very meaningful change, right, and the performance it can show you that if you don't code in a way that's suitable for Node.js, you're going to have performance issues. In this case, I have um, got a non-controversial uh, HTTP client fetching a large JSON from this uh, GitHub repo and calls it every single time in the request path, right? Let's go with it for now. So if you look here, this is again the same baseline that I had before. Uh, I calls the echo route that just returns the red headers. And here I start the call to this endpoint. You can see that immediately the CPU starts to spike and it goes up to 150, and that is what top was showing. You can see that the event loop lag, it grows. The number of requests 
you see here it decreases and you see here it's a good example that shows that the 99.9 .9 percentile start pulling up and then it pulls the 99 percentile and if the process had crashed at this point here that's a crash that's actually where it became irresponsive but if that have happened you would see that the 95 percentile would grow up and then you would see the 75 percentile go up but in this case here it just became irresponsive and crashed so you see here that the heap usage is way higher than it was before and because requests are taking longer and longer the in-flight request is growing right you also see big bump on scavenger but that is like completely in line with the cpu usage right so that's to show you how cpu starvation will cause problems if your instance is not responding it puts a lot more pressure on the other instances on the fleet and so on and so on and that becomes a, a snowball right so if you want to fix this well and this one is kind of obvious so if you want to fix that you don't want to call it every time in the request lifecycle the json is static it's not going to change and let's suppose that it's changed it's so big that you probably want to have some type of caching here right so if you, if you fetch one time the next maybe five a hundred a thousand requests it comes from the cache and even if you caching for just a few seconds it's enough for you to reduce drastically the loads that you have to understand this example I would like you to understand this registry class, which is an event emitter. So it has the all the methods from an event emitter, it extends it. This registry is something that's gonna batch. It's a, it can create an object that's gonna batch uh, sending metrics to a remote server, right? It's an example, it has a frequency, and then when you start it, it creates this interval that on that frequency, it's gonna publish those metrics. So you can register the metrics and then it will publish it. The metrics is an object that has a data getter and then you map and then we send it, right? It's important to understand one thing. As a design decision on this class, the registry decided to emit a data send event here when it publishes, okay? That's it. So here on this handler file, we have a counter metric, right? The counter metric takes the registry and then it registers itself on the constructor. And this is the important part. It will add a listener to the event data send to prune its own data right and start fresh every time it sends to the remote have no reason to keep accumulating more so here we have an example of uh, metrics middleware and in this metrics middleware we get the path and with the path we will create a new counter metric okay so here i start with the same baseline the baseline that has the echo handler and is just returns the request headers then immediately here i start a 10 percent increase you can see here that's a little bit more but it is actually what i told autocannon to do start a 10 percent increase on those routes and on that this particular events endpoint and you see that it's the CPU usage starts to grow. It doesn't grow absurdly, but yeah, I just let it for a few hours running. Uh, you can see that it grows, but it's not too much. The event loop lag a little bit more, but nothing noticeable. 
you can see something weird though. You see the 99.9 .9 percentile here going up. And here, even when I stop it, it kept going up, right? So let's try to get to the bottom of this. And I think I found it, right? Like it's definitely not the in-flight request because it seems like it's just a horizontal line here. It doesn't deviate. But if you look at here from uh, this point is about 33 megabytes on the heap. And on the top of this spike here, it's about 1.35 gigabytes. This is a memory leak clearly happening right here. And this is going to keep affecting my 99.9 .9 percentile here. Okay. So let's go back to the code and see. One of the things that you could have done here is, well, instead of letting the metric itself listen to that event being emitted and prune its own data, and the registry here, instead of it emitting this event, it will actually call the prune. Okay, so in this last example, let's look at leaky promises and how they affect our metrics. So here I have this nice module that allows me to create uh, and work that create a pool and work databases. And so I create a pool, I create a query, and here I will do a connect inside my handler, my route handler. Uh, this connects takes a sync function, and here I will just do a query that's going to query all the US states from the Postgres database. Then I'll return it and I'll call next, right? So let's see how this works, the metrics. Okay, so here Again, we have the baseline calling the echo about 4K uh, RPS. And here I start calling 10% increase to the promises DB endpoint. You see there's a huge spike on CPU. Um, so this is actually not a concern because DB access is something that's going to be slow most of the cases, and the other route, the echo route, wasn't doing anything. So yeah, you're going to see a lot of uh, CPU utilization at this point. It doesn't really, it's not the real concern at this point. Ideally, you want to reuse the connection pool. Uh, the event loop lag, uh, the heap, it's all good. Uh, you're going to see that the 99.9 .9 percentile keeps going up. So you probably want to look at other metrics and then you finally see it. When you start, the in-flight request starts to leak. And what does that mean? That you basically the promises are not resolving or they are rejecting at that point. And when they're rejecting, means that you're not sending the response, right? The res.json, if you going back and look here, it doesn't get here. It's just something happens. I know that because that never goes to the end and never sends the response, my in-flight request starts to leak. So this shows how in-flight requests are a good indicator when we have those kind of a leaky things happening. At this point here, I stop the calls, right? You see it going back to the whole echo endpoint, right, 100%. And then here, I start to call the other route. Let me go and show you the code. That one is the exact same code. The only difference is that I move the next and I add the catch here. So, what happens? Like, why? It's because, well, we're not caching it. And because 
I was using a promise and I was not judging it. I was never finishing that request. I was never properly finishing it. Now it is. So if you look here, okay, it's a huge CPU usage, even higher than before, but that's okay, right? That is expected. What happens here, the difference that you're going to see here is that now you have stable in-flight requests, right? Now you know a little more how to use metrics to improve your code. Use your judgment in every commit. Are the changes in the metrics in line with the code you are committing? What other metrics are important? There are metrics that I didn't have time to cover, like a GC utilization by type and promotion rate. A little research on that goes a long way. Metrics can tell you that your code has an issue, but not always how to find it. For that, you need to use diagnostic tools like flame graphs, heap profile, distributed tracing, logging, and others. Thank you so much, and I hope this talk has been useful to you.